Welcome, everyone. Um, good evening, and welcome to New America, New York City. Um, I'm delighted everyone is here, and I think we're in for a huge treat in our discussion of the response of the city um, and innovation and technology and their implications for governance. Uh, for those of you new to New America, new to New America NYC, uh, New America is a think tank, a nonpartisan think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to the renewal of um, American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. Uh, we have a tremendous roster of scholars and practitioners working on a range of issues in, in social and economic policy, um, and foreign policy in Washington, D.C., and increasingly a good number of us here in New York as well. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Georgia Levinson Coham, and I've recently joined New America. This fall I launched a program um, called the A New Initiative on Profits and Purpose, which is a program dedicated to social entrepreneurship, social innovation, and social investment across sectors, so in the nonprofit sector, the commercial sector, and the public sector. And I'm particularly interested um, in the spaces and the places where individuals and organizations from across the sectors come together in very dynamic ways um, to work towards social change. So I really couldn't actually think of a better topic um, for tonight to kick off my program, um, The Responsive City, and really a more sort of uh, rock star uh, set of panelists in the civic innovation space. So I have Susan Crawford, as you all know, Stephen Goldsmith, Stefan Perhus, and Jeff Merrick. Um, and I'm thrilled, and uh, we will talk more with and about each of them and their work. Um, before we jump into the uh, specifics of tonight's discussion, I just want to do a couple of quick thank yous um, to, to the uh, New America community, um, broadly defined. First, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, the President and CEO of New America. Anne-Marie's not here tonight, but I will say her vision and her energy for what um, a think tank really can and should be in the 21st century is very, is very energizing and inspirational for all of us. She's a terrific leader. Um, I'd also like to thank Rachel White, who was here earlier, um, who's now at The Guardian, and Faith Smith, who really helped build some of the programming for New America in New York City and, and gave shape to some of this. And then two more quick thank yous for the New America folks. I think both are here tonight. Um, first is Beth Dembitzer. I don't know if Beth is here. You may, um, no, she's going to come. Anyway, you may all know Beth certainly by name or face and certainly her work. Um, Beth has created um, and curates and runs the social cinema series we do here at New America, New York City. Um, I'll, it's just an amazing set of documentary film screenings and discussions that follow them. Um, we have a great one coming this Friday, which I probably it's a little too much of a tease to advertise Freedom Summer because it's sold out. Um, but watch this space for those of you who don't know the programming, it's, it's tremendous. Um, and then just lastly, um, I'd like to give a big thanks to Tyler Bug again, I think. Um, Tyler, most of you know by name and face, but Tyler is really the lifeblood of the programming that goes on in New America, in New York City, um, and really makes all the programming here happen um, tonight and, and every night. So Tyler, thank you. And Tyler said to me, send an email about this event a couple weeks ago, and he said, it's only been an hour or two and we're, we're sold out. And he said, that is a responsive city. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it was free, so being sold out. <laughs> Yeah, with priceless. food, <laughs> free with food, yeah. Right. yeah. Priceless. Um, so, uh, so with that, I'd love to jump in. Tonight, we're gonna discuss the response of city, and, and um, as I said, that's gonna be a lot of discussion of data, innovation, technology, uh, predictive analytics, but really, I think why we're here is to discuss, um, we're to discuss really democracy and governance um, and citizenship um, and how we might reimagine uh, to use Stefan's word, or rethink what civic life really can and should be in the 21st century. So uh, the game plan um, for this evening, um, I asked Susan uh, Crawford and Stephen Goldsmith to speak a bit um, to kick it off about the book, The Responsive City, about their work. Um, as you know, uh, I won't go into too much of the bias, but um, Susan and Stephen are both professors um, at Harvard and teach in different capacities. Um, Stephen at the Kennedy School where he runs the innovation program um, and is a professor in practice in government. Um, uh, and Susan at the law school in various capacities at the um, Berkman Center, uh, the, the Center on Innovation of uh, Internet and Society. Uh, but they also both have had um, 
really interesting careers as public servants and in the public sector as well in various capacities. Susan in the White House and, and Steve, as you all know, is the mayor of Indianapolis uh, and also is deputy mayor here in New York City. And then I will ask um, Stefan to weigh in a little bit about his work at GovLab at NYU, um, where he is the co-director, the co-founder, and the head of research and development um, to weigh in a little bit about what he's seeing in cities um, in relation to technology innovation and governance. And then finally, um, we'll get to hear from Jeff Merritt. Um, it's terrific to actually have uh, the New York City perspective, and I'm hopeful that Jeff will pick up um, really where, where Susan and Steve's book sort of leaves off, and we'll get to hear about really what's going on in this city now. Uh, Jeff is the head of innovation in the mayor's office of innovation and technology, so he can really give us some insight into how the city is thinking about um, tools and technologies and way to really engage citizens. Um, so, uh, with that, can I ask you two to talk about the book? Uh, for a, a minute, I think I heard you introduce Susan and, and myself as the past and Jeff as the future. So <laughs> <laughs> I kind of resent that, but uh, okay. it may be true. Um, so, just a couple of comments about the, uh, about the book. Is this as loud as it sounds up here? Oh yeah, the book, which is for sale over there, by the way, <laughs> next to the, you get a free New America glass of wine for every book that you buy. Um, so we, we started looking at it the following way. I'll just speak kind of uh, uh, generally, and then we can do more specifics later. And the <clears throat> theory I began with was that, you know, that uh, essentially uh, the tools of progressive government don't produce progressive results, right? We have a, a way we manufacture government, hierarchical, command and control, a narrow set of activities, a definition of performance that also often is how fast you run in place, right? Because we're measuring activities, not public value. We have employees that are trapped in, you know, between um, union contracts, civil service laws, uh, consent judgments, and swarms of city hall lawyers, right? We trap our employees and don't allow them to use their discretion. So meanwhile, that we have all of these goals of government and it's difficult to produce them. So we started to look at kind of how do the technological tools allow the structure of government to change in order to produce better results, right? Um, and, and so just quickly, maybe the elements that we thought about in the book were the following. Maybe a government could actually be predictive instead of reactive, right? So instead of maybe measuring uh, how many potholes you fill and how quickly you fill them, you might measure why you filled the same one 20 times in a row in the last three months, and then go solve the problem. The story in the book, and, I, and my apologies to Jeff, all of our stories are kind of Bloomberg era stories, not only because the book came out kind of that period of time, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we have a story in the book that everybody's probably read about or heard, which is, you know, a family died in a, in a fire from an illegally converted building. Um, I was worried, you know, I called, uh, I knew the Daily Press, uh, the Daily News or the Post was going to call, so I called the fire department. How many complaints have you received? Well, we, get, we received a complaint about that building, but we received 50,000 complaints a year, and the fire department said essentially the same thing, which is like, get off our back, we're doing our job. And then there's a little group of kind of data scientist guys stuck in the back of City Hall who didn't really belong to anybody but must have come from some NSA background. And they were back and they heard this conversation. They said, just give us 60 days. And they came back 60 days later and they looked at you know, uh, delinquent taxes, uh, foreclosure notices, 911 calls, 311 calls, code enforcement, and like one other was, you know, like six or seven data sets and improve the predictability of which of those 50,000 complaints are gonna to lead to a real fire, right? And then we signed crews, and they went out and, and remediated the problem, put in the sprinklers, removed the family, or, or whatever, the, you know, site of the slumlord, or whatever the case may be. So, so why can't government operate that way all the time, right? In terms of, of, of figuring out which child is gonna be abused again, where the fire is gonna occur, where the crime is gonna occur, and redirect the resources to what matters. So, that, so there's a predictive element. There's also an employee empowerment element uh, that we can talk a little bit more as the, as the night goes on, but instead of having our employees manufacture the same widget, regardless of whether anybody actually needs it, why don't we allow them to exercise their discretion, give them the tools, Right, we, you know, everybody knows you're here because you know that all these tools exist, but if you think about what's happened even in the two or three years since I left City Hall between you know, the ub ubiquity of, of, of uh, mobile devices, uh, uh, cloud computing, the, the, uh, the, the power of uh, data mining so that these legacy systems can be brought together, um, all of those things uh, can, we can direct to empowering our employees to actually solve problems and hold them accountable at the same time. So I'm, I'm about finished with this kind of riff, but just another example. I'm trying to 
trying to patronize the new administration by kind of <laughs> criticizing my administration. So, you know, I, I, I used to do these meetings out in, in the boroughs because um, I'm, what, you know, I'm not from New York and I'm trying to get to know people in the small restaurant tours kept complaining about the health inspectors like over and over again. And, they, and one complaint was that we keep getting $500 or $1,000 fines because our cheese is two degrees too high, right? This cheese would be a violation because it's been out too long, right? And, <laughs> and so I went to the health, health commissioner. I said, you know, this is, I mean, these are little guys, and this is a pretty big bite, and, 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 and what's the deal? Why don't we just give folks discretion? And he said, well, look, you know, we have a history of corruption in, in New York City, and we have rules, and we want our inspectors to follow the rules, and if we gave them discretion, how would you know that they wouldn't have used the discretion? Because essentially what we've done in, in terms of, of creating honesty in government uh, and to stop the abuse of discretion is we've made it impossible. We, we've eliminated discretion. So our employees have no discretion so they can't abuse it, right? Just kind of a blunt way to solve the problem. So, but now, right, we have, we have tablets. We know how long they're in each restaurant. We know from their GPS exactly where they are. We know who the outliers are in terms of infractions written or who, who, who the infractions not written. We know when people exercise their discretion to give a warning ticket instead of a real ticket, et cetera, right? So, so why don't we just give people discretion to solve problems and manage an accountability regime in a slightly different way? So we have, we have in the book, then, we think about predictability and employee empowerment. And uh, Susan will talk a little bit about uh, I think about the community engagement pieces that are really important because our goal is not to make uh, professional bureaucrats even more arrogant. It's right to make them kind of socialize a solution to problems, and, and we have that issue in there as well. And then finally, and I think both mayors uh, Bloomberg and De Blasio fall in this category, and several other people, like particularly Mayor Emanuel, that none of this works without leadership because government is vertical, solutions are horizontal. Somebody has to break through the barriers and give give the authority to do that. So. The book is a series of stories that deal with each of those categories, and I defer to Susan on her ability to speak uh, slower and better and more about community <laughs> in engagement. Thank you very much. Well, there's no one better to write a book like this than Steve Goldsmith, who's really a, a mayor of mayors and is giving advice to a lot of mayors across the country. And his deep practical experience informs the book throughout. And we've been talking about the book all fall. And this is one of the last events of this calendar year about the book. And so it's a chance for me to reflect on what I've learned, um, sort of the meta lessons here. Um, I'm carrying around this notebook because I want to read to you a, a New York Times headline reading, A Steady Drip of Lost Pride. Nation's confidence ebbs. You know how horrible the nation's confidence ebbs. That was about a poll about Americans' lack of trust in public institutions that Americans really didn't believe that uh, government was there to help them, that it was going to solve any problems, or even work with them, listen to them, in developing the solutions to those problems. And the great thing about this moment, and the reason we wrote the book, is that finally, storage and computation and connectivity and talent, all of these things are becoming more accessible, particularly to local government, cheaper, available, commoditized, so that just as young people expect that all products will arrive the day they order them, that in fact some company is, a, is going to predict for them what they need and get it to them before they even ask for it, government can be responsive in that way and visibly so that trust can be built between the people who live in cities and the people who run cities. Because cities, I've gotten very optimistic as I go from city to city talking about the book. People love cities. Cities are where democracy is still working. All the corrosive, polarized problems in Washington fade away because a mayor just has to deliver services, just has to make sure that things work and that people are happy and content. So the meta lesson here is that by having many touch points around the city, many visible moments where the city can show its work, can show how it's making progress for citizens, how it's listening. That's all possible now with uh, fiber everywhere, screens everywhere, uh, much cheaper computational products, and, and especially talent going into City Hall that understands that technology isn't just a tool that you think of at the end of a process. Technology is at the table. It's part of making policy. So it's a very exciting moment, and as I talk to actually huge crowds of students out there who want hope. They want to think that there's a way to serve, maybe briefly in government, using the tools they already understand to actually make life better for citizens in cities so that the local 
technology-driven nature of the stories we tell in the book is fascinating. So I've got some stories for you today that are actually updates from what's in the book because we finished it in the summer. And even though it was published very quickly, there have been a couple of administrations turn over. So Mr. de Blasio is here in New York and uh, Mayor Walsh in Boston. So in Boston, we told the story of Mayor Menino and his deep personal connection, beloved mayor for 20 years, to the people of Boston who uh, unfortunately died shortly after leaving office. He only wanted to use technology to reach more people, to help them uh, feel understood by the city. And so he developed the mayor's hotline into a tool for actually using your <coughs> smartphones to phone in about something that bothered you and let the city know about it. And then, since then, they've developed a way for people to see the solution to the problem they they uh, wrote in about on their, on their smartphones. And soon you'll be able to actually see a picture of Al, the guy who fixed the problem, which again gives this sense of you know, employee empowerment, public government. These are heroes inside City Hall, and the book is actually kind of a people magazine about the heroes. Mayor Walsh now takes this idea of Citizens Connect and the dashboard and the ability to see what's going on in the city and notices that all the systems in the city are separate. Performance management is one system, the mayor's dashboard is another, the mayor's hotline is another, they're all in silos with wonderful people. So the new CTO now, Yasha Franklin Hodge, is working on bringing all of this together, it's a big project, into one system that feeds up into 311 that actually lets everybody see the same information and understand what's going on. So big developments in Boston with the same citizen engagement at the heart of it. In New York, um, and I hope that Jeff Meredith, who's actually doing the work, is going to talk about this, very exciting project just announced um, uh, last week or so to make the moldering payphones in New York into high, uh, very high capacity Wi-Fi hotspots with charging stations, you know, so we'd be able to charge your cell phone. And really importantly for the responsive city aspect of this, a tablet that you can use to uh, learn about city services, to make phone calls. Imagine all the things the city could push to these kiosks around the city, and they're totally sleek, beautiful things. So taking the a Bloombergian suggestion and the payphone, but moving it in a de Blasio moment is really very exciting. It shows the power of leadership and citizen connection and engagement using these kiosks. It's going to be fascinating. Chicago, we wrote a lot about a lot in the book. Chicago's leading the, the tale of predictive analytics. Very deliberate work on pilots to better prioritize how the city uses its resources. But Chicago's also a story of engagement because there are so many civic hackers and community groups who are really interested in their city, love their city. And with the aid of foundations, the MacArthur Foundation and City Hall, this tremendous ecosystem in Chicago working together, they're making real progress under the leadership of Mayor Emanuel. So their, their updates on the predictive analytics pilots, they've, they, we keep talking about rats, they're sick of that. They'd rather we talked about another pilot. I still can't talk about it because they're not being public about it, but they will, dis, they will be talking about many more ways of drawing in data, looking across what the city knows and using that to optimize the resources. And if we wrote the book today, I would add the story of the city of Santa Monica, my hometown. I'm very proud to be from Santa Monica, where the sewer meets the sea. But it's a lovely place. <laughs> and there are, they have fiber everywhere now, a city fiber system. And they're using the Wi-Fi hotspots at every intersection to do things like manage traffic flow, understand where parking is, push city services, public service amenities. So they really see this as an integrated layered system, fiber, sensors, privacy protections for what information is gathered, very useful information in a small city of 90,000 people that is now looking to build a well-being index of life uh, funded by uh, the Bloomberg Foundation to measure how people feel about their lives and how they're thriving. So very meta. This has been a very exciting term for me talking about the book and thinking about the role of the university in stitching together students and city halls to get everybody working together, fellowships, enor enormous opportunities. As the university's business model is challenged by the internet, it's pretty apparent to me that it needs to become much more of a platform. And this precise kind of engagement between students who are desperate for hope and want to feel like there's a place to serve and under-resourced local government seems to me to be an incredibly fertile area. So the book's a People magazine. We wrote it with joy. There's much more going on. And this is the moment. There is no better time than right now to be serving in local government, we believe. Thank you.
Stefan, do you want to? Sure. Well, it's always hard to follow in the footsteps of uh, Steve and Susan. <laughs> I, mean, I always make some, uh, in the past I made like uh, uh, 10 things to do and uh, one is like never talk after, after lunch or dinner and so <laughs> the next thing is they never talk after Steve and, uh, and Susan because it can only go downhill from here. But the, um, okay, um, good leader. <laughs> but, um, so let me talk a little bit. So the Gov Lab is a new organization that uh, um, its mission is to uh, improve people's lives by changing how we govern. And so to a large extent, we focus on how we can actually innovate in uh, decision making, but also in service delivery. And we are somewhat agnostic of the uh, sector and somewhat agnostic of the layer. Uh, but cities is one of the areas where most of the activities actually happens. And so that's the reason why we started looking at cities, mainly from a, a perspective to learn more on how you can actually grasp the, uh, um, the activity that is there and then also then look at how can it actually transfer to other areas of governance because a lot of the innovation that happens there uh, hopefully would also happen at the federal level and, and which is also happening to a large extent. And so uh, let me just reflect a little bit about A, the book and rephrase a little bit about what the book, which is of course, anyway, comprehensive and captures uh, uh, all the uh, compelling stories on uh, why you uh, would be excited about. And to a large extent, I think with the book and what Steve and uh, Susan has said is that we're living in the worst of times and the best of times. And so the worst of times is clearly is that we have huge amount of challenges uh, as a result of urbanization, but also as a result of a more increased complex society that actually existing institutions have a hard time to deal with. Um, and on top of that, uh, we clearly see also a loss of trust uh, and partly that is because of the expectation that actually they should step up and they have a hard time to step up. And then we have something called the budget which is not really supportive of actually stepping up as well. So we have a budget deficit, we have a legitimacy deficit and we also have quite often an agility and effectiveness deficit uh, uh, and that's not only for city government but that's actually in governance in general. So we clearly have a huge amount of challenges. Now, the good part is exactly is that we do have a huge amount of advances in both technology but also in science that actually provides for new ways of doing things, that provides for ways that can actually deal with 21st century uh, challenges. And there are two things that come out of that that really are new assets for mayors, new assets for uh, uh, institutions to leverage to actually address 21st century challenges. One is data. We've never had as much data as we have, and we also never had the science to actually manipulate the data in the manner that we can have. And the second asset are people. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest assets of, of mayors, or the biggest assets of governance, uh, to a large extent are people, but we never had really the tools to connect people with governance as we had today. And so there's two tools, and that's what, from my point of view, what the book is all about. The two tools of, or the two assets of data and people create for a whole new way of actually governing and a whole new way of going about solving public problems. And uh, what Julia, who is in the uh, uh, audience as well, and myself have identified, which is responsive governance, but there are four ways of actually going about it. One is that data and people and how they are connected really allows for cities to be more connected in a way that we've never had before. And so we see this somewhat peer-to-peer -peer kind of urbanism uh, emerging, which leverages this peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, uh, platforms that exist also in the economy, but apply it to actually doing uh, public good. And so examples here, which are in the book, but other examples are, for instance, this uh, um, tool of Pulse Point, for instance, which actually connects everyone who has a CPR training and then if there is a cardiac arrest, you can actually connect directly with someone in the neighborhood who has a uh, CPR training uh, without waiting for the ambulance to arrive. And lesson learned is that the longer it takes, the less chance for survival. And so that connection, that peer-to-peer -peer kind of connectivity that you currently have is a whole new way of actually dealing with problems, in this case, uh, a, a challenge of public health and um, uh, emergency. You have many other examples like in San Francisco, I mean, Chicago, New York, Boston are clearly out there. San Francisco is another one of those cities 
um, in addition to Santa Monica, Thank you. Uh, is the uh, uh, <laughs> cities that are all in, in the lead here in the US. And so they came up with something called City 72, for instance, uh, which uh, turns out in an emergency, uh, quite often it takes 72 hours to really be able to reach everyone in an emergency context. And so the question is, how can you actually leapfrog and connect citizens so that you, you deal with this first 72 hours? And so C City 72 is a platform uh, that actually connects uh, uh, citizens in a way that can provide in an emergency context, like post-hurricane and so on, to actually provide services and help to, to each other. So anyway, so the first is the more connected nature, so this peer-to-peer -peer kind of urbanism, which is a kind of responsive city. The second one that we notice, which is clearly in the book, uh, and much better written than I will uh, uh, ever be able to, to share, is this notion of smarter cities. And here, we clearly see the arrival of urban sensing, which is very exciting, uh, um, because now we really can actually sense the city uh, in a manner that you never had before. And so that's the reason why they also quite often talk about this whole notion of quantified cities. Uh, we know the concept of a quantified self, uh, which you basically can collect data about yourself through wearables. Now you can, as a city, can actually um, um, quantify the city uh, based upon uh, the sensors, but also other tools that you have around. And so examples here uh, are, of course, what happens in uh, uh, Brooklyn with uh, CUSP, uh, the City for Urban Science and Progress, where they have this uh, um, urban observatory, which takes only 9,000 uh, pictures uh, in a day uh, uh, to actually sense uh, uh, the city. Uh, but also in Chicago, uh, array of things which are smaller sensors and which is going to be very interesting in, in New York, how you're going to connect that with actually the pay phones and so on. So there you see this whole urban sensing taking place. The other thing is, of course, and that's also where Susan had worked on in the past, is that you can also become smarter by actually opening up your data. And so the whole open data movement that actually opens up the data that cities already have and then allows for citizens to uh, um, create apps is another big uh, uh, movement that makes cities more responsive, but also puts actually the power of data in the hands of citizens. Uh, and then last, uh, what you also see happening is this whole arrival of citizen science at the city level, which is, from my point of view, not enough used <laughs> by cities, is actually how can you tap into the expertise that is within cities among citizens. And so the whole citizen science movement, uh, uh, which mainly is being translated quite often in actually uh, map creation uh, at a certain level, is another exciting one. Anyway, quickly, the third and the fourth kind of transformation we see is that what we call quite often participatory urbanism. We see it in participatory budgeting, clearly, where you actually engage with citizens in a total different manner, where you actually provide decision power at the level of the citizen than, uh, uh, than just uh, uh, assuming that representatives know best. Uh, um, but also civic crowdsourcing is a clear example of participatory budgeting, where you actually bypass uh, the budgeting process, but uh, find budgets and find funding through a direct kind of way of funding uh, uh, things. So this is another uh, uh, way in which you can tap into people. And then the last one is about more agile kind of uh, uh, governance, where you quite often see the notion of lean urbanism, uh, because you can be lean now, because you actually know or can, or can measure the immediate impact uh, that you have, which is another thing that has been missing to a large extent. Uh, so that you have this rapid cycle, or an agile cycle of actually uh, making uh, uh, policies. And again, um, predictive analytics comes into play. Chicago is taking a lead in that sense and so on. So those four uh, areas are areas that um, um, I noticed in the book. Uh, um, I'm always parochial in rephrasing <laughs> them, uh, but, uh, um, but it's a very exciting time, uh, but also a very risky time because it does require uh, rethinking processes, uh, which always uh, makes uh, many uh, uh, officials nervous. And so uh, with that, um, uh, I think um, I provided the platform to, uh, uh, to Jeff, which was my whole function here. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you. And, and uh, 
Jeff, you don't have to give a full state of the city, but, I'm, I'm, but, but before, yeah. before you do, um, if you could also talk a little bit about your background before you joined the administration. I think, you know, in some ways, sure. if, a little bit of color there, you, you do exemplify a lot of the new type of public servant um, sure. that we've all discussed and addressed, and we'd just love to know how you, how you came to this sure. post as well. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I'm going to start on a point that Susan said at the very end of her. She said, it's an exciting time for city government. Right, and, and I really, really believe that, and that wasn't the case you know, very long ago. I, when I first, I always wanted to go into government. I always thought if you're gonna do public good, you gotta go w to the place where public resources are aggregated purely s to, to create programs and sort of a s address social problems. So I always wanted to go into government. My first gig in government was in uh, Michigan State government in Lansing in 1996 and it was the most horrible place I'd ever been. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't believe this institution that was just so rigid and it seemed impossible for individuals to make a difference there. And that was only, that wasn't that long ago. That was less than 20 years ago. I don't know, state capitals, I don't think have changed as much as cities, but I'll put that aside. And so I quickly said, I don't know if I can do this, you know, government thing in the US. And so I jumped ship and I went over and started working in the Balkans uh, during the, this was the post, this was the, that was, I was working in Croatia during the Tuzman regime and then uh, post Milosevic, uh, Serbia and Montenegro and Albania and Macedonia over there because that was where democracy was really exciting, right? That was where sort of an authoritarian regime had fall down, had fell down, you were building it from the grassroots and I think over the years I sort of built up my confidence and uh, was back in the U.S. working on outside of government in the, what we call the good government sector, right? Um, putting pressure on government and I eventually uh, became a government contractor. I don't know why the New York City Department of Education thought it was a good idea to uh, select this small nonprofit called Grassroots Initiative that I started to uh, run community education council elections. Those are like our school board here in New York City. And so uh, we went and we ran those elections. We did them online. It was the first online public elections in U.S. history. Uh, previously that contract had gone to KPMG. We cut costs by, uh, I guess, costs were 20 percent of what they were the previous years. And the uh, public participation went up by five times. And that, I think, had sort of gave, given me the confidence that actually, you know, this, this bureaucratic institution can change. It just takes sort of someone taking risk. And so I took a risk then, started working for this guy named Bill de Blasio. Um, and uh, you sort of know where that led to last year, um, the election about this time, and, uh, and moved into City Hall. So that's sort of how I got here. And I would say that I do think that Government right now, and particularly city government, is a very, very exciting place. Uh, you know, my parents were biologists, and there's a term in in uh, biology in evolution and when you're talking about sort of evolutionary change, where they talk about punctuated equilibrium, right? Which basic idea is things are going along at a pretty slow pace, and then on all of a sudden, this very short period, a lot, or the huge amount of rapid change. And I have no doubt that's where we are in government. I, government, as Stephen said, was created to to build bureaucracy, right? To create checks and balances and things. And here we're at a point where with technology and the advancements in technology that in many ways we are the industry to disrupt right now. You've seen disruption happen through the finance sector and all of these different, you know, see our taxis have changed. And government now is being disrupted. The fact that an individual like myself even could work for a mayor's office and have a title like director of innovation would be absurd 10 years ago. People say that's an oxymoron. There's not innovation in government. But because of technology, there's incredible um, sort of opportunity there. And so I actually, I wanted to just give one story here. And I'm not, I was actually not going to do the payphone story because I figured that was one that you knew and it's in the press right now. And so I was going to give a story that folks might not know that hasn't been talked about. And so I think one of the key parts, if we say, like, what is it that, how do you enable that disruption? Um, what does it look like? So when Mayor de Blasio came in, if many of you are in New Yorkers, you remember the campaign, our number one issue was universal pre-K. Uh, we wanted to make sure that all four-year-olds in New York had the ability to go into free full-day pre-kindergarten. 
And so the mayor from day one, I mean, he was committed to that. There was no turning back. It had been such a big issue um, for him during the campaign. And uh, by April, we had uh, secured some funding from the state. Well, the plan was, he had already said, by September, he wanted to have 53,000 four-year-olds in school. So April, September, right? To, all of a sudden, you're going to have 53,000 four-year-olds. And so we had to figure out, how do we do that? Like, how, how do you make that happen? And I think that the first step in any type of disruption and innovation is taking, is bold leadership, right? If the mayor had not gone and put forward a seemingly impossible challenge, then this sort of next steps would not have followed. And so we had no choice but to be creative, to be agile, all the words that Stefan was talking about here. So we really quickly, I went and I, I pulled together some folks from the tech sector. I pulled together 12 different agencies that touched the different pieces of uh, the, the pre-kindergarten cycle. Because it's not simply about uh, putting, you know, opening up our schools and just letting, opening the doors and letting people enroll. You actually have to do a process by which the city selects uh, community centers and creates pre-kindergarten sites. You have to do health inspections of those sites fire department, there's a whole bunch of steps. You have to hire teachers and train them, right? And we were trying to do this in a period from April to September. So we brought all these folks together, but we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just the government team. We brought in folks from the, from the tech sector, from small firms and big firms, and we said, okay, let's just start mapping this out. And then we used some, you know, some methodologies that are becoming more and more common now, user-centered design. And we had big, I mean, we just filled a room with post-it notes and whiteboards mapping out all these systems. And what came out of that is a private-public partnership where we called on a number of companies. We didn't have a choice. We couldn't do traditional procurement. So, you know, Microsoft donated licenses. There was a company that provided uh, statistical folks. There was a fo uh, company that provided developers. We from the city pulled from different departments. And we said, OK, how do we get this done? Well, let's do what we know well. Let's treat it like a campaign, right? Because that's ultimately what we're talking about doing. How do we identify four-year-olds? And then how do we contact the households of those four-year-olds, give them information, get them into a program, and obviously we have to balance supply and demand here because at the same time that we're trying to figure out where the four-year-olds are and put them in programs, we've got to create the programs in the right place. If I put programs out in, in one part of the city and I've got a whole bunch of demand in another part, supply and demand don't hit, and then all of a sudden people say, this was a huge disaster. You have all these people that couldn't get into programs and you got all these empty seats, right? So, Here's what we did. We, um, we pulled a bunch of folks together. We put our heads together. We said, let's start with the data, something we learned from uh, Stephen the Bloomberg administration. So we pulled any data that we could get that could find us the four-year-olds. All right, so birth records. Who was born in the year 2010? All right, that was four years ago, but we, those are the kids. So we, let's start with that. Who had gone through any type of public program and at any point had identified that they have kids in their household? Uh, commercial data, are there are folks out there who are tracking who's purchasing diapers and that would give us an indication of where, you know, people that were purchasing diapers three years ago, those kids are probably four years old now. So brought together a whole bunch of different data sources, put them into a data warehouse, uh, got some outside assistant and used the team at Moda, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, to try and pull all this data together, eliminate duplicates. Uh, we built a basically a database system in nine days, pulled that information in there, and then we had call centers and we were calling out to households and saying, do you happen to have a four-year-old? Well, we've got this great program that we're starting. And somehow, miraculously, all that adds up to that between that time in April and September, 53,000 four-year-olds ended up in classrooms with teachers and we pulled off what everybody thought was impossible. I won't say that, you know, the challenge is next year I've got to get up to 73,000, which is, <laughs> which is an even bigger um, obstacle. But I think that the point here is that what we're doing differently in government right now is that, one, we have cities where we have great leaders, and you named a lot of them, and it takes bold leadership, and then it takes creative problem solving, and it takes 
utilizing these different tools, whether they be data, whether they be the different pieces of technology out there. And you sort of have to pull together all these pieces and it's a big risk and sometimes we will fail, but when we succeed, we can do amazing things. Right? There's a joke, there was a uh, story I saw where they were making fun of the fact that our mayor always is calling everything historic. Right? And it's true, it's true, it's kind of comical. You, you put together a clip <laughs> of all his speeches and he's saying, yes, this is a historic moment for New York, and a historic moment. But that's what our job should be if we're going to be public servants and we're going to be in what is ultimately like the capital of the world, a great city like New York, everything we do should be historic and it should be big and bold. And I think that finally government is catching up to that and people are realizing that. And so I will end there because I know there's going to be a lot of questions. But I do think it's a great day uh, for government. I think that you're going to see a lot of changes happening. I think, you know, thank goodness that we have folks um, like Stephen and, and Susan who are documenting this and really I mean, I, you weren't the past, you guys are the trailblazers. Um, we wouldn't be doing what we are today if you were not there. And you're enabling more people, you're enabling this to spread, which is critically important. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great story. Yeah, it was wonderful. Did you register the four-year-olds to vote, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very early enough. <laughs> We're not entirely off the hook on the uh, on the phone booth uh, link, um, and especially because I have to put a plug that's uh, New America's OTI yes. group as a partner. So we will, if it's not asked, um, I will come back to that um, that particular project. Uh, I think I get to the prerogative of maybe the first question or two before I know there are going to be a lot from them before I open it up. Um, so the first is so so Mike Flowers, the former head of analytics and delivery administration, sort of said, okay, the data the data genie is out of the bottle, mm -hmm. um, and sort of data and analytics um, and these type of technological innovations are here to stay. And I guess the question I have, or what I was really struck by reading the book, was you know you've all said in various forms that sort of the, the the data and the innovations, the technology are are terrific and they're good, but they need to be good for something. They're essentially tools and they're means to an end. And, and I was struck. I have, my questions are about actually maps and apps. Um, there were two examples in the book I was very struck by where a particular way of either visualizing the data or a particular tool actually resonated um, in, in perhaps an unanticipated way with a particular group, either government employees or the community at large. So I'm thinking of the mapping example, whether it's sort of in the slums of, of Rio or in India, where suddenly you're putting a community on the map that wasn't, or you have citizens contributing to the map. And I was struck where you said, um, turns out that people actually react much more power. First of all, there's a, a dispassionate, not an emotional right. response, but also that um, that maps versus, say, graphs were, are very compelling visualization tools. I thought that was interesting. And the second on apps, I think, it's, I think it was the Boston example um, where they, they noted that um, when people called in on 311, it felt like complaining, but it was a very different emotional response when people were able to use their smartphones and it actually felt like they were constructively engaging. So I, I just love briefly to hear from from each of you, um, particular tools or technologies, maybe it was intuitive, maybe you were surprised, that, the, that really unlocked community engagement in a different way. Well, I'm so delighted you started this, because for me, visualization is the, is the secret sauce. Leadership, incredibly important, but we don't make progress on anything until we can see it. And uh, I keep learning over and over again that you put a group of different stakeholders that may be fighting with each other in front of a visualization that they trust, and the emotional temperature really does go down. People start solving problems together if they can see the problem. We didn't have an environmental movement in the United States until we could see a picture of the Earth from space, because we had no sense of it as a vulnerable thing. So visualization, absolutely important. And maps work because we're, we can see ourselves. We're, you know, we're like babies. We're looking for other things that are like us. And a map, we can, we can picture acutely how that feels viscerally. I think emotion is incredibly important to all these processes. The idea, I love the line from Boston that you, you're helping if you're using an app from Citizen, like Citizens Connect, you're not complaining, you're helping. And to harness more and more of that energy gives rise to what uh, Jeff's talking about, of, of engaging lots of different communities in co-producing solutions to very difficult problems. So those are two terrific examples, visualization and apps. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, but let me just uh, abstract <laughs> Susan's comments for a second, right? So the, the, the power that we 
are witnessing and advocating is the connection between, if you think about big data as the data analytics inside the government enterprise, I think Jeff's story about preschool is actually just a fascinating story. And then you've got information in the community, right? And you can, whether you're taking social sentiment or social mining or communication tools or crowdsourcing, whatever, and value comes when those two things connect, right? So, so if we think about visualization and open data and open performance as elements where they come together in a powerful way when you have the data and you listen to it, right? So and you listen to people who are engaging with that data. So I, I, I just to reiterate the visualization tools are powerful because they unlock insights in the part of the community to issues which had been trapped inside the government data originally. So, so yeah, so let me focus on two tools that were not mentioned in the maps and the apps, which is the, uh, uh, the huge potential of, on the one hand, gaming, uh, which quite often gets, uh, uh, gets ignored. I mean, there is some uh, examples as well, especially in Boston, you have the Engagement Lab, which is doing great work uh, with regard to actually uh, um, engaging citizens in a game style fashion, which uh, uh, is absolutely, I mean, I would say everything is better than surveys. Uh, 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 in the current state and age uh, to actually get people to engage and also to then uh, basically see solutions and co-create solutions in a manner that is somewhat systemic uh, and in, in, in a different kind of way. So there's a lot of potential here uh, as well, especially given different audiences that you might reach. But one, t one area that we haven't really progressed well and where GovLab is uh, um, uh, somewhat focused on is the area in which you actually match skills and opportuni with opportunities. Uh, meaning, from a, to a large extent, we have clearly apps, we have a lot of maps, but we still don't really know who knows what in society. And so, from, from a mayor's point of view, as I already indicated, the biggest uh, uh, asset that you might have are actually the citizens in your uh, city. But how do you know as a mayor, meaning it's already hard to know who are the four-year-olds, how do you know who actually knows what and can help you co-create a solution? And that's a big challenge that we can uh, tackle partly through network analysis and data science, partly through actually creating new platforms that can profile Anyway, and that's a, that's a term that quite often creates all kinds of privacy advocates to, uh, to jump, but that can profile expertise in society differently. And I think this, this still uh, is uh, missing somewhat. Uh, and uh, there are a variety of uh, uh, um, graph kind of tools, uh, which is where I wanted to end, graph type of tools that uh, still needs to be applied in the city context. So if I was to say what a, like what's a game changer in terms of a tool that enabled civic or sorry civic engagement and I've spent a lot of time in civic engagement I think oftentimes we think that civic engagement is the end goal and we have to always put it remember that engagement isn't just good for engagement's sake uh, that so oftentimes people think about sort of these heavy technology tools and they think about hackathons and these very labor intensive processes but I actually think some of the most game changing tools are the simpler things so things like the 311 system, nothing changed government in New York, uh, in my opinion. I, nothing was a game changer like 311. Because it was just so simple. The idea was just one phone call that connected everything. Right? It didn't matter what you needed, you had one phone call. And that's engagement. Because when, when an individual contacts government and says what their problem is, they're giving data, and that data then is running government. Nothing changed. I think the functioning of cities like the 311 system. Um, and it, is it a technology tool? Yeah, there was technology under there, but it was something simple, it was something basic. Um, and that's the beauty is if people can engage without actually knowing they're engaging, that's magic. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, all right, one, one more. Uh, and I, um, this is a little bit about outside of New York. So uh, we can debate whether New York or uh, Santa Monica or Indianapolis is the greatest city in the U.S. But, uh, but most of the examples in the book, and you do touch on Louisville and Detroit, and there's some Baltimore and Philly examples, but for the most part, we're talking about New York and Boston and Chicago and cities with great leadership, outsized mayors, and um, you know, very vibrant for the most part, private sectors and terrific research universities and philanthropy and sort of a lot of resources. And you, there are some interesting examples in the book where you talk about cities sharing with other cities. Um, like the Chicago data. Um, smart data smart, portal. The, the, yeah. Right, they can sort of be replicated. But I, I guess I'm thinking about cities that um, 
in the U.S. and globally that don't have these resources, and how how are these <coughs> tools and these energies and you know entrepreneurs, resident, how is all of this available to them, or how, where are they being? Well, a great story along these lines is Detroit, which has figured we've got nothing else to lose, so let's really move forward on this front. And they've got fantastic people. The mayor of Detroit drove to Louisville after the CIO in Louisville refused his job offer three times. He said, you have to come work here. And he drove down, got that CIO for Louisville, brought him, her up to Detroit. And uh, they also have a wonderful citizen engagement manager. They are really seeing themselves as going to be at the forefront of all this responsive government stuff because they want to understand their city better, want their citizens to feel engaged in the process of government. <laughs> I've got one more story, which is that the big cities are not yet moving ahead on fiber. A lot of second cities are. And that's where you're going to see a lot of uh, positive feedback loops of being able to ship around all this data, use it easily, and, and feel no delay, no hesitation in using it to run the city. So you could. Um you could think about this as a, as a uh, series of uh, uh, modules that get plugged together, right? And so some things, uh, cities with leadership, no matter what their size can do, and others are kind of escape their, their grasp, right? So, so you could have 311 call centers in any city, and those call centers can evolve like New York City's is about to, to become platform for engagements because they go from calls to SMSs to tweets to whatever. Then you can think about uh, open data. Do you ha really have a, a true open data program? And, 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 and not just ones that put up kind of ugly public documents and PDF files, but ones that actually have usable data that's up there. Then you got performance programs. Um, uh, let's call them stat programs, right? Uh, you know, a, a process of managing by metrics. Um, and then you've got, um, uh, uh, then you get to more sophisticated stuff, right? So can you really do data analytics and predictive analytics? Well, probably not. You don't have a resident data scientist. There's not very many cities that do. But could you do that as a shared service, right? What's the relationship between the private sector and the public sector? With cloud computing, can you lower the cost of, uh, of, of doing that? So, but, but in the end, as you move from the simple uh, to the complex, the cross-cutting theme, of course, is leadership because it, it's, uh, it's beating up the uh, agency bureaucracies in the verticals and creating that environment. So I, I think there is a very serious uh, shortage of talent in the more sophisticated analytics stuff. And um, some of that can be somewhat mitigated by creative app developers who develop something in New York City that then goes nationally. But on the how do I analyze my data, that piece I think needs uh, a lot more help nationally. Well, I think meaning for, for every city to be successful, I think they need five things in place. And so if they start sharing across those five things, I think there will be huge success. And unfortunately, it's not happening one. One is exactly what has been mentioned. It's not per se leadership, but it's really understanding the value of certain kinds of tools. And so if someone here in the audience is a developer, they should take the book and turn it into some kind of an interactive expert uh, system in which it said, for that issue, give me examples that I can copy, right? And so you need to get a better sense about what are the horses for what courses, right? So what tools are, can be used for what objectives? Because it's not like every tool can be used for all the objectives. So that's the first thing. The second thing is clearly you need to have some kind of a technical infrastructure. And again, that can be uh, leveraged by shared infrastructure to a large extent. Third thing that you need is that you do need to have policies uh, uh, in place. And again, policies can be transferred from one city to the other city, knowing that to a large extent they are context specific, but at least you can have some kind of shared policy uh, kind of uh, environment. Then you need training, uh, and that's where uh, um, a lot of the training uh, of city officials uh, need to, needs to change, but can also be uh, across uh, uh, cities to a large extent. And then lastly, uh, you really need some kind of a movement in which all the chief, which is already happening, chief of innovations are actually connected uh, and share and become a movement of innovation uh, to a large extent. And I think that will bring us to actually becoming more inclusive so that actually smaller cities or cities that don't have that kind of leadership also have the potential to innovate. 
So on this note, I'm not going to be as optimistic as I was on others. I think in the collaboration space, in terms of collaboration between cities, um, I think we have a ways to go. I think we're probably five years away from real strong collaboration. I think part of it is that the reality is in individual governments, we have a lot of silos and where technology is helping us to be able to cut across those silos. However, every city you talk to, they're all dealing with that right now. And so it's a, when you talk about cities and they've got all their silos and they're dealing with that and starting to get their hands around what to do and then you want them to go and collaborate with other cities uh, which is a whole nother silo right uh, I think that we've got we're a little ways from there it's not I mean I think we have to move there but we haven't figured out the sort of methods and processes yet uh, but without a doubt I, I feel there's an incredible amount to be learned in both directions I feel like the small cities uh, where, you know, I think of it like a big ship and a little ship, right? It's much easier to turn that little ship. They can do some amazing innovative things that then, in, think of it, it's like they're piloting it for us and then we can bring it to scale in the big cities. Uh, but they can also learn from us in the big cities because we're able to do things that just such, we have so many more resources and things like that. So I think there's a huge um, wave of opportunity there. I think we're a little ways off, but we'll get there. Um, I'm going to, Tyler, can I turn it over? Too. I know there are loads of questions, so um, please, if you're, if you'd like, please identify um, yourself, affiliation. Well, I have loads more questions. <laughs> yes. oh, cool. Hi, I'm uh, Julian Zelazer. I'm a professor at Princeton and a fellow here. Um, so the last time there was the kind of promise of efficiency was the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And kind of historians who study it, study that one of the costs of new administrative bodies and bureaucracies were new forms of disenfranchisement and new forms of control. Um, and do you see some of those dangers? So if you talk about data at the federal level, everyone says NSA and everyone talks about the, the threats that have emerged from that, is that not a part of a problem that might emerge from this new response of government? And uh, if so, what are some measures that are taken in cities like New York uh, to make sure that's not the case? Not just in data knowledge, but even in access to yeah. all this technology. Um, I throw that out there. Well, um, I suspect we all have partial answers or no answers to that question. Um, so let's think about it in two different ways. One, and let's, I think I'd like to strike the word efficiency in my answer, right? Let's think about effectiveness or responsiveness. Efficiency has a little bit of a sound that we're going to do things cheaper, right? So we'll come back to that. I know that's not how you meant it. So, so I think I would think about the answer to your question as, as follows. One, if we only have limited resources, if we can redirect those resources to where they're actually effective, which providers are helpful with which kids, which preschool program works more than whatever what another program so we have the dollars that can be redirected and reorganized we're looking at a lot of, of activities in child welfare what what provider what caseworker is good with what sort of family you know how do they so all of that provides instead of like really expensive random control trials provides an opportunity to at least redirect the resources then secondly and Susan and I just wrote a, a uh, an op-ed in the in the Boston Glo uh, Globe about this right yes we did yes we did <laughs> um, so um, um, I think it's a mistake not to acknowledge that there are two sides to this coin. The, the power of data to help is the power of the technology to intrude on privacy, and, and, if you, and you have to recognize it. So, so we have been thinking that a city that wants to be in the vanguard would have an explicit and transparent privacy policy. It would have what data is anonymized. It would have what the archival policies are. It would have who could look at that uh, data. Susan teaches a privacy course. I'll let her kind of finish it. But I would just basically say that I think we ought to recognize it's a problem and, and then use that to kind of go forward. Lastly, really quickly, and um, uh, Stefan's more of an expert at this than I am, but, but why don't we think also about how to use technology to increase the voice of those who are, who are ignored, right? Because it's not as if without, it, it's not as if before smartphones that uh, wealthy and the influential couldn't find their way to influence public policy, right? Even, a, even the people who call 311 are not exactly a 
and those who call their city councilors, et cetera. So, so then you say, okay, well, if we have a huge, uh, very significant adoption rates of smartphones, then why don't we kind of organize virtual marches on City Hall or, or evaluate, like Mayor Gray's doing in D.C., how responsive a public official is in a certain program to a certain resident. So it's a long way of saying I totally acknowledge the question. I think it's a very serious and dangerous question on both sides, but there's a lot of power here actually to lift people up who have been ignored. Just to add on to this, so I, I teach the law of surveillance as well as talking about the responsive city all the time, and I, I recognize the, the deep tension there. And right now we have tech-happy people on one side who don't think about uh, privacy at all and, and aren't worried about policies. And then we have the people who are so freaked out, they, they'll start worrying and upset every government program. So what we're talking about is the need for actual policy leadership as well as tech leadership doesn't exist now. But there are three areas. It's not just privacy. It's also all that uh, reform around the turn of the 20th century gave rise to some very good ideas. No more nepotism in government, government contracts, right? and uh, great care over uh, procurement and, and great care over civil service rules. This is what made Teddy Roosevelt's career, was reforming civil service, that's how he got going. And now those rules, the pendulum has swung, and those rules are like a thick growth of kudzu on government's <laughs> ability to do anything at this point. And it's, it's like, here Jeff, Jeff said we couldn't procure, because that's hopeless. You know, we can't do that. So. We have uh, so many policy challenges, privacy is one of them, and human resources rules, civil service rules, and procurements are other two enormous. And that's why my job is to train people who understand technology who can go and work on those policy problems. I don't want, I don't want to take more than my <laughs> share of time, <laughs> but um, the turn of the century progressive Teddy Roosevelt government assumed that the w way to reduce these abuses that Susan referenced was through a very uh, rule-driven, control-driven system. And that there was always, up until recently, a trade-off between accountability and discretion. So more discretion, less accountability. I think that the technology tools today that let you look broadly at how discretion is exercised, which police officer has the most complaints, how does he, what type of person does he stop, what health inspector does what, allows us to challenge the assumption that the only way to get accountability is to, is to have these very narrow rules. And I think that may be the biggest breakthrough that we see in the next five or 10 years inside government. I'll just jump in that, uh, you may not forget the exact wording in the book, but something like software code can sort of take the place of some of what legal code did prior, which is mm -hmm. in fact, I mean, privacy and the surveillance issues considered. <coughs> but that there is some of the transparency that can come through code, I mean, can, you know, for example, in procurement. Right. It's just, it's not magic, though. It always is backed up with a human being making policy, but applying more discretion to the rules because you can see more. That's what we're, that's what we're uh, suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is, this, is this on? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just talk a lot. Uh, big fan of the book. I uh, just oh, finished great. reading it. Um, Tell your friends. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, this question comes from like the perspective of an outside consultant who works as a designer. Strategist. Actually, my name is Gatamba, and I'm a strategist and designer. And um, what's interesting is I was part of the RFI RFP process for the wireless chargers and the designing of the phone booths. And being in that process, it was interesting to be part of having a city that has a digital officer who has a process for calling out uh, private sector people like myself who work for Amex or Apple and I find myself designing for a city. And that was a really great process and it was a really fun process, but then I found myself uh, wanting to try again and working at Hartford, Connecticut, where um, we didn't have any of those kinds of resources and we were dealing with all these kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, micro, macro, and meta things all at the same time. And I guess my question kind of comes down to like how do, we start getting people like myself who are interested in and part of this movement of wanting to change institutions, change services, but also don't know what are the motivations of the cities, who should we be talking to at what level, and how do we like earn a place to be able to say design is not the, the genius on a pedestal, but, mo but maybe more of like the, uh, the, the butcher making a sign for you to facilitate uh, a way to you know, build a product or a service or a process that shows you how to eliminate and detect errors over time. Yeah. So uh, here's here's my opinion. I think Hartford's going to get there, um, and I'll I'll tell you honestly. I'll tell you how the the fastest way they're going to get there. They're going to get there by people like you, 
who are getting frustrated on the outside who say, you know what, I'm going to look and I'm going to take a job inside government and I'm going to try and start changing it from the inside. That's how it happens. I mean, that's the, that's the short of it, that um, you can't just wait for things to change. At some point, you build up that courage, you get yourself inside, and you start to sort of break down the, the barriers. Um, and it'll also help that, as, as you said, you know, like New York City was at the, the forefront when they created a position for a chief digital officer. Now you're seeing those positions become much more common, not only in government, but in all kind, you know, in the, they're in the private sector. It becomes part of the vocabulary. And on everything, it's about sort of someone getting the ball rolling, and then that momentum builds, it snowballs, and then, you know, you'll get to the Hartfords. But obviously, the fastest way for Hartford to get on the fast track is for, you know, bright people with big ideas to get in there. And it'll, it's, a hard, it's, a, it's hard work. It's not easy, but, yeah, that's, that's part of it. And some of those come from countries where they have like the Nordic model, where there's a lot of homogeneity that makes governance really easy to do these responsive things versus Hartford. Hartford. <laughs> Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Brian Rich. I'm a I'm a speechwriter and a bunch of other things, but sort of my side interest is disaster preparedness. Um, so the smarter and more uh, effective that you make a city, you know, benefits the population to a certain extent or to the extent, to use the pre-K example, that you can reach and engage and find the right people. But in something like disaster preparedness and specifically the individual completion of, say, a disaster preparedness plan, which we're all encouraged to do by FEMA and mm -hmm. state and local officials, Anything short of 100% participation from the citizenry is, seems to me sort of like a, a failure or at least a missed opportunity. And there's this sort of give and take where we need 100% participation from citizens and then the data that they would generate would certainly benefit the city and vice versa, but there's this disconnect that seems to prevent cit the majority, if not the entirety of citizens from participating. So I guess the question is, you know, most of what the responsive city is about is about the city and the city government and the city infrastructure improving and thus improving services by default. But what responsibility exists for the average citizen and how do you sort of get over the inertia problem of most people just saying, oh, a disaster is going to strike and the city is going to take care of it or, you know, whatever. Seems to me that there's something missing in the conversation between the average citizen and the responsive city that needs to be figured out. That's a great question. I think that it's very important to build up, bulk up the role of intermediaries, smaller civic groups that, because I don't think the individual citizen left to their own devices is going to figure out how to uh, build a disaster recovery plan. But through their, you know, their community center, their church, their collaborative, Chicago, it, it, in the book, um, we talk about the role of the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which is foundation funded and does a lot of outreach on, uh, with respect to technology between city hall and community groups on many levels for sort of beta testing of new things, for sensitivity testing of uh, privacy concerns. And you know their motto is, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work. So there's an inspirational leader of that group in Chicago. There should be, and there are in New York, actually. I'm now thinking of all the different kinds of intermediaries who can take on that role, but you know, as translators, as inculcators, as trainers, um, to, to build the link between citizen and, and city. I think it's a very important point. There's another way to think about, uh, consistent with Susan's response to your question. So, so when I was deputy mayor, I used to go over and kind of look at the, there was a, careful this is recorded but there's a there's like a, a spiral notebook for every disaster you can imagine that's in New York City so right so and there, there are books everywhere and they're they're very detailed plans of course New York City is the best disaster response place in the country literally but they all depend on uh, people in government uh, anticipating and planning that a disaster will occur exactly the way they think it will right 
which of course it never does. That's why it's a disaster. Um, and, and, I mean, really, right? So, so one way to think about this would be um, how do you plan for resilience and recovery? How do you plan where the, the guy who's going to give the CPR is located? Right. And, and I, think, I think we saw uh, you know, in Sandy, I wasn't here in Sandy, but I think we saw in Sandy a lot of the impromptu app activity in, uh, that was, uh, you know, community response kind of made up for the fact that there were some holes in the response system. So if we thought about government as intentionally seeding that, right, and organizing that and anticipating that, then we could have a much more uh, uh, resilient response and a lot more community participation at, as it relates to the event of the catastrophe itself. I just want to... Um, way in the back. Let me get this guy first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Billy. I work in advertising. Sorry. Um, I have a simple question, which is, what's, what's one program or government initiative that, that doesn't exist right now that, that you personally wish existed? And I want to hear every single one of you. Oh. A program that doesn't exist today? It doesn't exist. <coughs> Maybe some programs that shouldn't exist. Um, <laughs> look, we've got in um, Chicago, and I think actually under Mayor de Blasio you have this as well, which is essentially integrated data analytics effort uh, in essentially the mayor's office, right? So, so a, a program that exists almost nowhere is a program dedicated to using data for performance evaluation throughout government, right? So, and that would dramatically change the way things work. That's very rare. It's organized to work in, in this administration, actually, is more, I think, brought it together more than the last administration, and Chicago is a, a pretty good example, a platform that organizes data for performance. And I can link that to the training, the, the, the talent deficit that yes. Steve talked about earlier, that if it was much easier for people to come in just for two or three years, you really can't do it for one year. You've got to stay for a little while and lend their skills to government and then go back out. And if that was easy in every city and easy in every state and easy at the federal level, we'd be making a lot more progress than we are. Right now, we don't have that. And the civil service rules are really difficult. It's hard to hire, hard to find the resources. And I think that should happen. So as I mentioned, I think what is really missing is this whole concept of managing expertise in society, right? So how comes City Hall does know your skill set in advertising, and when they want to actually tap into your skill set of advertising, how can they reach you? And so if you can come up with networks of expertise that is either self-disclosed or done through some kind of uh, um, either uh, network analysis or other ways of uh, uh, being able to actually identify expertise in society. And that doesn't have to be professional expertise. It can also be e interest or can also be experience. Someone who has experience with disasters is an expertise who can make the city more resilient. How do you tap into that kind of expertise? Should be an objective uh, uh, of uh, um, all city halls and platforms can be built uh, to actually allow that. And, and that would be a total rethinking uh, of actually the talent deficit uh, because you can have talent in government, but there's a lot of talent out of government and that requires quite often rewriting policies and so on. But that seems to be uh, the big missing part of the current uh, innovation. Now, I'm gonna give you something very specific. It's not the end all be all. It's something that I was frustrated with last week and I, I proposed to somebody, I said, can you figure out how, to, how do we make this? So uh, I was in Barcelona, Stephen was there as well, a smart cities event, all these amazing people from around the world. And the challenge is also always there. You're meeting these people, they're doing great things. You should collaborate, right? The earlier challenge here, how do we collaborate in an efficient way? And my frustration is like, I can be on my Gmail and Gmail's reading my emails and it's saying, are you interested in buying flowers, right? It's telling, because it's seeing I'm like writing about somebody who, I don't know, you know, somebody passed away or is sick and it's saying, you want to buy chicken soup, right? That we should have a way on government to make collaboration really simple and straightforward, right? It, we should, we have the ability with data um, and technology now that I should be typing my email and it's popping up things and saying, did you see this Harvard study that was just put out by Susan Crawford where she's got new ideas on how you could do this more efficiently? Or it's saying, did you know that this uh, city, that this person is working on the same issues of data privacy, right? <laughs> how do we make collaboration easy so I don't have to stop my work and say, how do I find somebody who's doing something 
similar or relevant. That's similar to that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big challenge. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew Fine. I'm a lawyer. Um, I guess I want to ask about how you think of problems in government with the use of technology. Um, we have in New York City the city time scam. We have the comptroller saying that thousands of computers and tablets are missing from schools. We have healthcare.gov. We have contracts, tons of agency contracts that are way over budget or never fulfilled. So I guess you haven't talked about the difficulties of government procuring technology and uh, using it well. Uh, so yeah, just wanted you to see how you can improve that. Well, the healthcare.gov debacle was a, a beautiful case study of all the things we were talking about not happening. You know, with no... Uh, because technology was treated as ministerial at the very end, if somebody else would figure that out, wasn't part of the policy building process in creating the program. Um, it, and because only a very, very large contractor with not that much relevant experience in running this kind of thing could get on the approved list through the procurement process to provide that website. And because uh, there wasn't adequate project management at the high levels of uh, the White House because they're all economists and they don't really think about technology. Because all those things happened, that program did not go well when it was launched. And the recovery from that is another example of leadership, you know, better procurement, real public-private partnership. People flew in and tried to help and fix the situation. And, uh, and bringing the technology question into the heart of work there. So, the healthcare, for me, that story crystallizes all the problems so, of working in government te with technology. I, uh, I inherited city time after it was a half billion dollars uh, over budget. <laughs> Af after, let me just start the story so I'm not indicted here. Um, so so I, I think my s response to your question would be, the, would be the sim similar to Susan's, but would be the following. A, uh, large enterprise programs are all virtually impossible and always over budget. Two, that uh, sophistication of complicated program management does not generally exist inside City Hall, even in a New York-sized city. So that you end up with vendors managing vendors who are managing vendors. I mean, City, city Time was a little complicated because we also had corruption in addition to mi mismanagement. But, but the point is that if we could modularize more of the offerings, right, if we could purchase more offerings off the cloud instead of kind of enterprise offerings, if we could have more sophisticated program management, then we could begin to, at least to kind of implement these things in, in bite-sized chunks. And just, just to reiterate Susan's comment, that uh, to the extent that, and, and this is a story we tell in the book, right, is that even the data analytics stuff, you don't want to set it up as a data analytics center. You want to set it up to solve a, a number of use cases, right? Mm -hmm. So to the extent in, in, in the healthcare example that it was run by the techies and not by the uh, by the people in the program itself is another kind of failing. And, and so if you get those things right, I think you can at least reduce some of the uh, problems that, that your question references. So I'll answer it really quickly. Um, so I think the modular approach is right. I mean, our new chief technology officer likes to say that projects are too big to succeed, right? Um, which is, I think, oftentimes the, the problem in government. Uh, but I also think that you have to remember t procurement processes were not designed for technology. They were designed, to, for example, if you want to buy a bunch of pencils, you say, I need 20,000 number two pencils, and then people give you bids on that. Technology doesn't work that way. Oftentimes, we don't know what the technology is that we need, and the technology is, going, is advancing so fast that by the time we would procure it, it would be out of date. And so part of what's going to happen, need to happen in the next couple of years that a lot of us are working on is how do we get the lawyers in many ways comfortable with the fact that we have to switch that around and say, we don't know what the product is we want. We're not putting out all the requirements. Actually, we know what the problem is, right? We know what the problem is, and you have to tell us what the solution is that will fit that, and then we have to be able to compare solutions and say which of those solutions is the better fit for government. It's a challenge because the rules aren't set up that way, uh, but I think that's where we're going and where we'll ultimately need to be to be successful. And it turns out, I mean, we do a lot of training as well in the um, GovLab Academy that I have, turns out one of the biggest challenges is actually defining the problem. Uh, uh, and, and because t people tend to go immediately to the solution without actually really thinking whether uh, and what the problem is and whether the 
the response is adequate for the uh, 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 for the problem. In addition to then also module modular uh, kind of uh, approaches and more anyway applying the agile kind of uh, uh, methodology that is being used. Uh, but that's sometimes where it starts. Ted Perlmutter, Columbia University, and, and I teach on social networks and conflict. And I'm from St. Louis, so I have to ask the inevitable Ferguson question. Um, and to me, what's striking about Ferguson was the fact that there was really nobody that the police knew to call. And there was very few people in the community who could have been called. And I, what I'm sort of wondering about is from a kind of a data analytics and network issue, how can you, one, work to sort of set that up working for both on the government and the community side and also figure out how that scales? Because Ferguson is only one of 100 small municipalities in St. Louis County. And I realize you know, that cities like Boston and New York are much better at that. And if you, you watch the news and you watch the mayors respond, they were sort of incredulous about what was happening out there. But um, so that's the question. Uh, <laughs> I was trying not to answer that question. Well, it's such a sophisticated question. I mean, but, I'll, but at one level, right, technology doesn't solve cultural problems, right? So if there's, a, if there's an attitude in a governmental institution that is uh, bad, then uh, you can use technology to manage it. So let's just, let's, just, let's just kind of separate out training and culture and, and, and attitude and recruitment and whether a police force should represent uh, in, in terms of diversity, its community, and all the rest of those things. Those are all, they're not what you asked about, but they're kind of predicates. Um, one of the ways, I, I think a lot about networks, maybe not at the level of sophistication you do, and one of the ways to think about networks is the extent to which government enhances its legitimacy through a deep connection with a nonprofit or community player, right? So, so because government depends on its legitimacy, and, and, and maybe that's in fact the, one, of the, one of the morals of the story in Ferguson, with very little legitimacy, and then there was an act, and the act it kind of you know, touched off the reaction. So to the extent to which we're thinking, going back to Susan's comment, that, that we have an intermediary like Smart Chicago, and we have government that now is providing open data and, in, in, and participating and developing deep networks. And I think to some extent, um, I don't know whether it was Bill Bratton or someone else said that, you know, the part of the problem was the police officer was in his car and not on, not on the street, right? That the car itself is a barrier. So if we think about physical and technical barriers and we eliminate the physical and technical barriers, we have explicit networks with community organizations and then we look at the sentiment that's being generated from, those, from that uh, uh, social network, then I think we can actually encourage a lot more trust. And, and we think in the book about the fact that, you know, little acts of trust and responsiveness build up the reservoir necessary to do big things uh, and to overcome big tragedies like Ferguson. It's, it's, I feel like my answer is totally insufficient because Ferguson is such a big issue, so I've tried to kind of narrow down on the, on the parts that are relevant to the book. And anybody else is totally welcome to answer the question. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Jennifer Gore, and I have a tech startup here in the city. Um, so I guess I fall in the transparency side of the argument. Um, but my question actually is about employment. And one of the trends that we've been studying is uh, the movement of the U.S. workforce to freelancers. And I think right now it's about a third of the U.S. workforce projected to be over 50% in about five years. Um, and so I was just curious, I think somebody asked a question and you've already answered uh, part of my question, which was where are the gaps that you see that we need to really be watching out for? Um, and I, I totally agree with the, the you know, skill matching. Um, and I guess my other question is, so if there are any other gaps you see related specifically to how you know, we can be ready and adjust to this trend. My other question is, what do we have uh, that's sort of in place, and who are the people, the companies, the programs that are doing things right um, that, that might come to mind, and or cities in general that you think are getting it right? Yeah. I don't know if I, could you, could you just repeat the part about the gap? You, you, the gap, tell me what you mean by the gap, what the gaps exist in 
Uh, sorry, I messed that a bit. Right. So I think, well, one example I think that you mentioned early on was using the kiosks for Wi-Fi centers. Yep. I think that one gap might be city infrastructures aren't, we're not, we're not really set up in major cities for a ton of remote workers. So, mm. you know, I think that's one gap that I might flag and say, well, Wi-Fi and infrastructure is one. I would say workspace is another. <coughs> There's the whole co-working movement, and I think with co-working spaces, we see that happening. So I would say space might be another. You know, you see all these sort of empty office spaces and empty storefronts, and yet you see really populated coffee shops and people sort of camping out in parks in the nice weather doing work because a lot of them don't have offices to go to. So those might be two gaps, but are you know, others that you might see or, again, not to just dwell on the negative, maybe things or cities you see doing it right. So, yeah, I didn't, I missed it. It was the gap in terms of enabling a more sort of mobile workforce and independent workforce. Um, I think you're exactly right. I mean, <laughs> I just feel what you said. But I, I definitely feel that um, getting us to a point where connectivity is a no-brainer in terms of that we have high-speed internet wherever we go um, opens up the entire sort of city as a platform, right? It, it doesn't become an issue of, it, you don't have to go to the coffee shop because you have connectivity anywhere and with you know the devices nowadays are increasingly getting more s smaller and more powerful so place becomes irrelevant and then what we're seeing happen is I, I really think that the private sector is leading here in terms of you know I loved all of the co-working spaces in New York like we work is definitely one around the world that I think is leading the way and demonstrating a different way for people to work and that's gonna end up coming into government and that's going to end up coming into more and more companies because they're realizing that is much more efficient to have open workspaces that aren't, you know, cubicles that are fixed into the ground um, that people can move around and collaborate more easily. And so I, I do think that we're moving in that direction. The only, I would say the gap is purely uh, it's connectivity and it's in some ways trust within the institutions, trust within government, for example, that folks will work just as effectively from home or the coffee shop as they wor will in the office. And in fact, I think that what we are seeing, especially the technology sector, is demonstrating that folks are more productive and more creative in that in those environments. So I think tech, the technology section part of government, like the innovation labs, are going to lead the way in showing that there's a new way to do work, and then I think it'll spread out from there. So what is really needed is a uh, is a rethink of actually how you match as, as anyway. I'm a big believer of the potential of uh, uh, platforms to match opportunities with uh, uh, skills, but the third element is training. And so you basically need to develop a triangle in which you have the opportunities, the employment opportunities, the skills, and the training that then uh, is somewhat in sync so that you can actually quickly and more agile respond to opportunities even if you might not have the skills but can acquire the skills by rethinking or by gaining training, which showcases why it, uh, universities somewhat are, is an old business model that is not really uh, uh, um, capable of actually uh, providing that kind of matching in an agile uh, manner. But that's really what is uh, provided, uh, what, what is needed. In addition to that, there is, meaning partly thanks to technology, there's a lot more markets out there that you can tap into. And unfortunately, that kind of support uh, uh, in order to actually export uh, and, and tap into new markets outside of the local markets is quite often uh, missing as well. And then the other element, we just finished a report on open data and small and medium-sized enterprises. There's a lot of uh, support needed to actually use the asset of open data, for instance, and apply it to the needs that small and medium-sized enterprises have because that's really where the value might be because small and medium-sized enterprises hardly ever had access to market intelligence, mm -hmm. but now suddenly open data provides them with a tool that makes them uh, uh, much more smarter, uh, but quite often they lack the, uh, uh, the tools and the capacity to do so. So there's a lot that can happen, uh, and, and clearly the narrative of technology kills jobs is partly true, uh, and I think it's our job to actually turn this around and looking at how technology can actually both create jobs or create uh, a better matching between the jobs that might be out there. Um, I think we have time for really one more question because I uh, maybe to flip the 
start with one because I probably would be trains to catch this evening. So, um, yeah. Hi, my name is Clara. Um, I run a nonprofit in San Francisco that works with startups looking to solve community problems in cities. Um, and my question is sort of the flip side of open data. I think many of the most successful examples when we think about good uses of open data are actually um, private enterprises providing data to mm -hmm. government. So I'd point to like Waze, for example, during Sandy providing information about where there were open gas stations or even an Airbnb providing information about where there were housing opportunities for individuals mm -hmm. who were temporarily displaced. Um, how should government in the future be thinking about not just pushing data out but being more um, thoughtful about capturing data that might already exist and, and making good use of it? Well, my new passion is uh, opening up corporate data, so, uh, uh, which I think is the real next generation of open data. And I think, uh, meaning open data, I mean, we, we still have a long way to go with regard to open government data. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong here. But the real important information that is still locked up is corporate data. And uh, there are a variety of ways to actually open it up. I mean, we have identified six ways that, that can do but there is a lot more experimentation and a lot more value cases to be built or use cases to be uh, uh, experimented with in order for that kind of data to uh, unleash. Is that a role for government? Um, I leave it up to, uh, <laughs> to Jeff. To, I think it's really a role of uh, corporate leadership as well. And also start thinking what is actually the business case of opening up corporate data and, and having, uh, having actually also that kind of perspective that actually by opening up your data, you might actually uh, A, create public value, but also as a result, uh, have a business case to, uh, uh, to do. I think there's a funny, you know, in my pre-K example, I, I actually, we actually bought data. We bought commercial data, which to folks in government, they, they were like, what do you mean you're going to buy data? Like that was such a crazy concept to them. So there's this like weird stigma in government that they don't realize that that's actually an incredible, like, incredible the return on investment there was huge because government can use private sector data to do a lot of things more efficiently and it definitely pays for itself. So I think that's something that government is learning and I think you're going to see more and more government now that we're understanding that data enables efficiency um, and they realize that they are not the only source of data that you're going to see more and more governments looking outward and saying, Oh wait, maybe we could use that data to, to add to our data and that type of thing. So. Um, well, I want to say, before, before I thank everyone, I just want to remind um, you all that the books are available for, uh, for, for purchase and for signing. And we had, uh, what are like Black Friday, uh, Cyber Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> and then Responsive City Wednesday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but, Thank you all well, for coming and thank you for a terrific conversation. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you.